I am delighted to be joined in studio by Galway Harper Una Ni Flanagan, uh, who last week took home the gold. Uh, Una, originally from Crockwell in County Galway, um, now living in Barna, took home the Sean Rita gold medal for Harp on Friday last in the final broadcast live on RTE Radio Nagwilta from Cork. Una, you're very welcome. Thank you. Actual. Thank you so much, Funny, and thank you for having me. <coughs> there is this, this, the, the studio uh, is bedecked now by a most unusual sight. There is a large uh, harp in situ, and it is the neo Irish harp, and it is uh, sitting here beside me now, and it is a beautiful sight. Um, tell me about yourself and the harp, Una. Okay. Where did that? Where did all of that begin? Where did it all begin? Well, the harp started around one thousand one hundred years ago, but I started around thirty years ago Brilliant. in Crockwell. It intersected uh, at some point. Yes. <laughs> at age eleven, I got exposed to it, and uh, as I'm fond of saying, um, I was a really mediocre, unmotivated fiddle student. I'd been playing music since I was three, and I'd always wanted to be able to play with my dad, but I didn't really figure out that you needed to practice in order to make it sound good. The, the, the whole theory of the ten thousand hours hadn't hadn't reached Crockwell. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh Vinny, I love you already. The ten thousand hours is one of my favourite phrases. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, yeah. So I figure right now I'm on hour around eight thousand four hundred and thirty two. We're getting there. <laughs> okay. The, the, the clock is ticking. Good. Yes. Um, I would have thought that 11 was, was kind of late to be picking up a, an instrument like, like this. Well, do you know what's really interesting? In general, in harp, up until our generation, people didn't start it until they were 11 or older because, first of all, it's quite big, right? So relative to, like, a ex- uh, violin, it's four and a half a tallish. So if you were to pop that onto the shoulder of a 10-year-old or less, maybe, say, a 7-year-old, you'd be squared at a fall and squish them, you know? Of course, and then be, there will be a health and safety issue. Exactly, that. yeah. Um, okay, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, and then secondly, um, it's quite. Uh, it used to be quite an expensive instrument um, to start with, so that meant that, like you know, really, you just had the daughters of very, very high income people starting it, or sons. Um, so, was was the general thing that people would would take up another instrument, or, or would learn another instrument, and then move on to the harp? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, you've got it in one. Um, now, one of my favourite kind of uh, rants is that you should be able to start the harp for cheap. So, there's these wonderful small harps after coming on the market now, and they're on sale from different makers all over the world. There's some makers in Ireland, there's some makers in America and other places in Europe also. And uh, it's a real phenomenon of the last five or six years and it means that you, whereas normally you'd have had to have an outlay of say two and a half thousand euro for a large full size harp, now you can start the harp from anything from 450 euro up. So it's an amazing phenomenon and it's really revolutionised the instrument and I think that in the next decade or so we're going to see a huge impact from that. There was a period Una, was there not, when the harp nearly disappeared. Absolutely. From, from Irish life. It was, it, was it around the end of the 19th century? Or You're totally bang on. It was around the 1800s. So yes. essentially, now, I would love if there's historical harpists out there to correct me, right? But in my experience, it, like, as I understand it, um, the Belfast Harp Festival of 1798 was essentially the closing of a period of great harp activity in Ireland. And then because of political and, and social... revolutionary year, 1798. It was. Obviously. And did I get that right? I, ha- I think I might have gotten that wrong because it's not actually... Uh, it's 17... Oh God, that's so embarrassing. It's 1792. Oh, it's 1792. Okay. Not, 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 <laughs> Excuse me. Six years off. Oh not, God. Not, not six years, we're, yeah. we're talking about a couple of hundred. Exactly. So um, anyway, because then of great political and social change, there was nary a harp string plucked for the years of the 1800s. And then in the 1900s, as part of the Gaelic revival, people started trying to get it started again. And um, one interesting thing is that the ancient Irish harp was strung with metal strings and it was relatively small, say three, well, I'm really extemporizing here, but like maybe two and a half to three foot tall, Mm -hmm. uh, three and a half foot tall. And um, when they were reinventing the Gaelic harp and along with their image of Irishness in the early 1900s, um, they went and looked abroad and the pedal harp on the continent and its cousin, the lever harp, were all way bigger than the ancient Irish harp. And they took inspiration from that, probably musically and in terms of just a physical model, and made a neo-Irish harp, which is round four and a half foot tall, and they strung it with the same material on the continent, which was plastic. Or sorry, it's plastic now, it was gut at the time. Mm -hmm. And on the continent, they would play with their finger pads. So you make a lovely round sound like this. Whereas in the ancient Irish harp was strung with metal and would have been plucked with the nails, giving a really long, resonant, more metallic tone. Now, this is a really rough approximation. 
Okay, um, that's just me plucking a metal bass string with the tiny bit of nail that I have. Um, but hopefully, you can hear a rough idea of the difference. So we actually have totally two totally different instruments it's, in Ireland. Okay, and and how many people play the harp? Um, approximately. Approximately. Yeah. There's a census out there that says approximately 400 and something professional performers. I think it's more. Um, For professional? Yeah. Professional performers? Yeah. yeah. Really? Now, what's also interesting about that census is that the majority of those professional performers are not full-time. And I think that because... I think that's because the harp is a very heavily gendered instrument. So unfortunately, far more so than accordion or fiddle, um, there is an awful lot of people who play the harp who are women. And uh, then, for example, the pipes, seal and pipes, very rare to find a woman who plays the pipes. It's usually a man. Mm-hmm. Now, there are fantastic, amazing exceptions to that, such as... Uh, uh, there are millions actually I'm scared if I mention the men that the other men will get annoyed at me so I won't but <laughs> for starters Michael Rooney who won Composer of the Year this year um, and also another guy who was in the competition we call him McGonagall and oh, the list goes on Ushin Morrison who won the competition the year before me blah blah blah, blah. But, <laughs> um, but, so there are wonderful exceptions but uh, I suppose I'm saying this Cormac Tabara you see I shouldn't have even started you're but I'm down this road now you're going no, to I'm going to experience <laughs> harp har- I, I don't know harp uh, harp uh, what's it called when they put you into the silent place? Coventry, Harp Coventry. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea. Um, mm. But a lot of them, uh, the census uh, actually said that perhaps one of the reasons there are very few full-time performers on Harp is because a lot of the f- performers on Harp are women and unfortunately um, the take-up of professional musicianship is lower amongst women than men. Well, okay. Um, I still think that's a pretty high figure. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, that's, that's considering there was nothing at all. This is ago. true. You know, you're right, actually. If I take the long view, you're right. Yeah. That is a very positive figure. Okay. Um, you were growing up in, in Crockwell uh, in your teenage years, lugging around a harp. How, how was that in terms of the peer experience? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, so uh, there was part of me that felt really special and different because I played the harp. And there was another part of me that felt really stupid because... Um, so on the harp, right, there's around eight different ways to play each note, okay? Yeah. So you can play it with your thumb, your index finger, your middle finger, or your fourth finger on your right hand. And then you can equivalently play it. You can approach it from any of the other fingers and you can descend from it to f- another finger. So there is eight by seven by six. There's all of these multiple exponential ways to play each nose, note. And that means that it's simply longer to learn how to play a tune on a harp than it is, for example, on a tin whistle when you just have play D at all times with six fingers down. So I know there's different parameters and variables on each instrument, um, but in my experience, the harp does take longer to get good at. Now, the good news about the harp is that you never sound crap. The sound is very, like, I'll just play for you here. That was just me drawing my harp along, my hand along the strings, like, no effort. It's just a fabulous tone entirely naturally. So that's a wonderful asset. Like, you never sound aggressive or out of... Yeah, yeah, it's nice. You don't have that like, two years on the guitar before you can leave your bedroom. Exactly. Um, or the yeah. violin screeching or the pain of the guitar either. It's quite gentle to play the harp, so that's lovely. Um, but I speak as somebody who tried to learn guitar and failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I suppose, uh, so when I went to sessions, all the fiddlers and flute players and accordion players around me would know like hundreds of tunes and I'd only know like 10 and I'd feel so thick you know so that was hard but I suppose I and, and does, does does the harp fit into a session if if you were to, to join one like come that? to Cheek Holy and I will show you Vinny okay. <laughs> massive shout out to Cheek Holy by the way they're <laughs> lovely thank you <laughs> a great resource for, for the whole of the traditional world absolutely so, yeah you, and, and you play in there for, uh, from time to time. I do, yeah. I play in Chicoli's for one, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so the uh, what's interesting actually about the harp is that the ancient Irish harp was its own art, art, art tradition and the people who played that instrument were very high in status and didn't actually interact with the kind of f- folk people of the time, we think. And then in the maybe... And were six, they mostly men? Um, actually, yes, mostly men, mm. which is really funny, isn't it? But uh, And then there was this kind of transition period when like you know our uh, you know our, our sovereignty was challenged and there was a breakdown of our political order so because of that um, the harpers who had high status weren't as easily to be employed because 
they simply didn't have Irish chieftains in the places of power anymore. And because of that, uh, the Irish Harpers lost a lot of their status and started interacting with the people on the ground a lot more. And that's where you get Sherlock O'Carlin from, who was this fascinating mix of the art tradition he came from, plus the amazing jigs and reels happening in the folk music of the time, plus music from the continent. And then there was the hiatus we talked about in the 1800s. And then when it was reinvented in the early 1900s, the harp was mostly used for simple harp uh, song accompaniment, actually, um, a la Mary O'Hara, etc. Although, let me not and say... Mary, of course, is a, a resident and, and she lives in Galway now. Absolutely, and yeah. Between Ireland and Galway. And actually, I'll take away the word simple. We'll just say song accompaniment because actually some of the accompaniments were really, really complex. And then finally, in the 1980s, this amazing young woman called Marnie Kosig, um released an album called The New Strong Harp, which was a uh, definitive moment in Irish harping really because she played jigs and reels on the Irish harp for the first time in a really compelling idiomatic way and from then on thousands of people have striven strove to copy Marnie Kosig uh, playing jigs and reels and that's the tradition I belong to. And that's where you come from. Okay now you're going to play something for us Luna. I am. Um, what is that? I'm going to play a piece of music I composed myself it's called Rune's Tune and I'm going to go into a couple of jigs for you. Very good okay and while you do that I'm going to go off and get a camera and make sure I get a photograph of this moment. <laughs> okay, this is Una Nee Flanagan and a composition of her own on the Neo-Irish Harp. <laughs> 